Hey guys, I'm Big Mike, and like always, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Today we've got Suri Dadella here to talk about. Sorry, my uh, mic just froze up. Uh, here to talk about pivots, volatility, scalping, and patterns. Uh, this webinar is actually one of 16 very special webinars that we have going on throughout the entire month of June, and that's for our four-year anniversary here at BMT. Uh, we're giving away lots of great prizes in all of those webinars, uh, about $10,000 worth of prizes, in fact. And in this webinar, the prizes are 10 autographed books written by Siri Dadella. Uh, the book is called Trade Chart Patterns Like the Pros. Uh, some of the bullet points that he wants to hit on today include how to pivots work with patterns along with the uh, pivot confluence, scalping uh, counter trend and with trend trades. Uh, he wants to talk about the differences of being a trader versus programmer and how that can impact you, uh, trading with and against volatility, breakout trading versus pullback trading, and micro patterns and large patterns, the difference of those and how to trade them, and last, the uh, choosing the right time frame to trade. Uh, he has asked that you hold all questions until the end of the presentation. So once we get to the end, we'll open it up for questions, and then we'll get those answered. And then uh, once that's done, sorry, once that's done, we'll do the uh, prizes. Okay, guys, and with that, here comes Suri. Sorry about the background noise. That always can't can't control when my dog uh, right. sees something out the screen out the window. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. And uh, I'm just going to maximize my screen. I guess. Uh, can you see my screen, Mike? Yes. Okay. So I'm just going to maximize the screen. Yeah, it looks How good. That okay. Fantastic. Thanks. All right, guys. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for uh, inviting me. And really, congratulations on your. Uh, uh, fourth uh, anniversary of a big mic trading forum. Fantastic! That's a great achievement. Uh, I guess I'm sure all of the all the audiences feel the same way too. Uh, today I am going to present the topic. Uh, uh, it's, uh, actually, the pivots and the scalping and all of them are part of a, a single umbrella kind of market context tools. And uh, so what I thought I would do is I would bring these topics under this umbrella and then. Uh, talk through them because I know that most of the time I talk about the chart patterns but market context and using the pivots and using the you know the techniques of the volatility and how, how do you treat scalp, uh, you know, scalping the patterns and you know this is all is part of the essential market uh, uh, trading and I guess you know so I thought that you know I would do this side of the presentation this and I you know when, I, when Mike requested I said I guess you know we will we will present this side of it and then that way we can you know, know you know what how I think about the pivots or how I use them. So anyway, the first what I thought I would do is I'd just uh, walk through uh, part of the presentation first. But I think first I'll give you the agenda. Uh, before I go further, I want you guys to take a minute and read the disclaimer. I, I'm not an investment advisor, and uh, and all the material I'm presenting it today is purely for educational purposes only. And material, you know, this is you don't need to copy anything here because Mike is going to post the presentation and all the material I'm presenting itself is the copyright protected. So what we'll do, the first thing is what we'll do is we'll just go into this uh, topic of a support and assistance but I'm going to primarily talk about the pivots. And then next we'll move on to um, you know the trade entry and then uh, how do you trade? Would you trade a pullback or would you trade a breakout? You know which is important. And some people trade think that you know breakouts are better, and some people think pullbacks are better. So if it is, you know they both are they both can be done. But how do we do it? At what? Uh, so what are the basic rules of it? And I got a couple of examples to show you and also a couple of you know, ways how I look at the breakouts and when do I take the pullbacks and what type of minimums I look for it. So right after that we'll go into what I call is a micro patterns or a large patterns. You know, should we trade, you know, can we really trade micro patterns? You know, because if you're a scalp trader, you know, you think that you can actually trade really small, small patterns, but can it be really done successfully? You know, if you're trading patterns, what do you need to look for it? So that probably gives you an idea of, you know, whether to trade a micro pattern or a large pattern. So I'll just discuss that part of it uh, for in a few slides. 
And the next one is, uh, I'm going to go and talk about the volatility. Uh, this is not the same volatility what, uh, you know, options, uh, you know, uh, uh, I guess traders use it or, uh, or even you know the analysis and it goes behind the VIX. But this is the type of volatility what operates in the intraday trading, you know, when the prices are moving there, uh, when the prices are randomly moving and you know, over the time, you know, for example, today we have seen it uh, right from uh, about 11 o'clock onwards, there was a massive volatility kicked in and then it quickly reversed the entire day and it went back up almost like, you know, 15 points up. So this type of volatility, how do you measure it? And I actually have a tool which I, I am just going to show it to you. And uh, then how do I measure it? This is the this is something which all of you guys can actually use it in the sense is you know uh, this concept of uh, volatility. And the next is uh, then I'll go into uh, talking about scalping and counter trend. Uh, this is a, you know I got it just about only like a five six pages of a draft copy which is actually free copy. It's not completely done, but I wrote this about two three years ago. And then you know since then I wanted to release it, but it's never done. But I'm just going to release it anyway. So this talks about some of my scalping rules which I wrote it. Uh, since then I moved away from scalping, but. I do want you guys to see because lots of traders are scalpers and then they also trade counter trend and trend. So it just has some basic rules so we just going to talk about them and then uh, I'll just talk about you know what is the counter trend and how I use the trend methods type of thing. So, but this is a kind of a good guide for uh, scalping and counter trend tool and I'll, I'll just show you. There is a PDF out there and I posted the URL there and I think I will send it to Mike and Mike can probably place it in his forum somewhere too. And then the last topic what I wanted to talk about it is a trader and developer. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, developers and there are a lot of traders and really this, these two areas really don't mix very well, but although lots of developers do think that they can become traders. So, and I'll talk about what are the advantages and disadvantages from the developer's perspective because I am both, you know, because I, I wear these two hats, these 100% trader hat and 100% developer hat. So, and I do not mix them at all. So, but then I'll talk about, you know, why I do not mix them and then, you know, what needs to be done if some a developer really wants to become a, you know, a full-time trader because I went through that transition and it's not an easy transition and it's very difficult. Uh, but I'll just talk about, you know, what I think about it. And, uh, the, and then right after that what we'll do is we'll go into a question and answer session. So if you have any questions, you can send it to Mike right now, I think. Uh, we'll hold on to it and I will answer it in the end. And uh, then, uh, then also right after that, you know, we have a, uh, a 10 books, you know, courtesy to Mike. Uh, he is uh, sponsoring these 10 uh, copies of the books. Uh, on his uh, fourth uh, anniversary. So I have about 10 questions prepared for it. Uh, you know, these questions primarily, actually all of them come from my presentation. So just play, you know, like a close attention to it. So that way, you know, we'll just, uh, these questions are, these are not typical at all. <laughs> these are pop right from the presentation at all, presentation itself. And uh, with that, I wanted to get started. Mike, uh, is everything okay? Can I go ahead and start it? Yeah, it looks good, man. Go ahead. So, the first topic is, uh, it's actually comes in the pivots and everything, but before that, the concept is, you know, what are pivots, right? You know, because pivots are part of the support and resistance lines and, you know, most of us traders, we spend lots and lots of time reading the market. You know, we are reading the market to see how price prices are acting to, you know, reacting to different levels, pivots, moving averages, you know, different type of uh, trend lines and then, then how the patterns are forming. So we are spending lots and lots of time actually reading the market and then trying to look for a trade opportunity. So what happens is this is so there are there are quite a few types of resistances and supports you know out there exist. So I, what I thought that I would just list few of them. These are the one. This is not the entire list of it, but this is the list which I thought that you know, I'll show it to you first. The types of support and resistances are something like moving averages we all know, and then there's a VWAP which is a kind of a derived uh, version of the moving average, but it uses the volume and it's kind of a very popular with the professional traders. And then bands, you know, different types of bands. You know, we have Bollinger bands, Fib bands, and whatnot, right? And then, then the second topic, which is actually this is the one which we're going to we're going to discuss quite a bit, is a horizontal price. 
uh, levels. These are derived price levels, these are also called pivots. And this is what I'll go into more details in the next slide, couple of slides. And the third is the trend lines, and these trend lines could be angled or it could be horizontal too, but most of them, the trend lines are clearly defined because they had to be uh, meeting the supply and demand pivots, means they are connected not randomly, they are connected only on the based on very critical uh, price levels. And, and so they can be angled and you know, then people use them to you know, trade breakouts and, uh, you know, or even you know, uh, use them for support and assistance levels. And the fourth one is a pattern of structure based uh, you know, support and assistance. So these, these things you know, can happen in a, you know, different types of patterns and they are actually probably you can construct trend lines from them too. The last one is the gaps, you know, gaps are also part of the support and resistance. Uh, if you guys look at, in fact, today what happened, uh, if you go back and look at your S&P, uh, uh, S&P today came down to that, uh, actually, yes, came down to 1596, uh, 1596 is the gap level and that, that is, the, in fact, it's not completed, but the, surprisingly that is the point today it came down and then it quickly bounced 20 points up. 20 points up today, it happened here from uh, about 11.30 to 12 o'clock onwards. And then, the, so the last two, three hours we saw the rally, that, that rally happened from that gap. So gaps also can be supported resistance levels too. So the next one is, so as I said, I, I'm not going to talk about all the support and resistances. And uh, here, I listed some of the horizontal price levels. The horizontal price levels are pivots. First of all, pivots is the one which I'm going to talk about. Again, there is quite a few of them. In this, just the listed out. And the second is the standard dev levels. Uh, lots of people use them, and if you ever use the Bollinger Bands, it's a similar construction. Basically, from a moving average, you know, we, we take a certain type of standard dev level, like a two standard dev up and two standard dev uh, and then we look at look for the support and resistance between them. And the third is the current day levels, which is high, low, mid points too. Uh, again, the fourth is in the trend lines, and these are connecting the pivot points. And the fifth one, which is probably not uh, people use it a little different because I use it this way. And as I said, I do not use the price profile in the auction theory basis, but I use purely from support and resistance levels. And that's where we use the value area high, low, and POC lines. And the last one is the gaps. And these are all part of the horizontal price levels. But we are only going to talk about today only from the pivots. The pivots are, uh, which everybody knows about the flow trading pivots and then the Globex pivots opening range and fib zone. And these are, you know, my way of looking at it and how I trade them. These are very, very essential part of my trading it. And I actually study them every day morning before the markets open. And then I figure out, you know, how the prices are, how the patterns form. Um, one definite thing I wanted to say is I'm not trading pivots. I never trade these price levels by themselves. I always trade the patterns. So my entire theory is how patterns form between these pivots or, you know, or any type of a support and resistance I'm laying out on the charts. So I'm trying to look for how they are forming. So that's what my way of showing it and that's, so let's go ahead and start looking at the pivots. So the first is the pivots. So, so the, the top of it is pivots are like a, you know, there's a, these are purely horizontal lines and they are imaginary lines. So the imaginary means, you know, there's nothing price really occurred at that point. You know, most of the pivots are primarily, they are derived. That means we are computing them. You know, we are saying S1, S2, or R1 and R2 type of thing. And these are all purely derived from the price levels, what happened from the yesterday, or the prior session, or yesterday, or, you know, people calculate even for weekly and monthly, or the last hour, or whatever, right? So, primarily pivots are nothing but a support tools. So, and my theory is you never trade a support tool by itself. So, you always trade a, a, a setup or a pattern. And then the support will support the pattern. They, so you can't really use pivots to trade it. So if that's the case, why are they so popular? You know, everybody uses flow trading pivots. And so I use it too. So then I went and said, okay, let me go ahead and study the pivots and see, you know, is there any valid theory in it, you know, then and that, you know, when we, when we trade this pattern. So that's what is, I'm going to present it, you know, this is from my research of it and how I, how I came to these numbers. And also, um, pivot prices are never used it for a new trades, you know, I'm not, I'm never using a, you know, price is going to bounce from a, a pivot level and then, okay, I'm just going to buy it at the pivot type of thing. I'm always using these price levels 
to basically use it as a confluence element so that way I am using it as a target but it's never an element for me to enter into a new trade okay and then always trade them with the patterns and setups and the set that's what it is so if you look at any of my like a very first beginning charts which I posted on my trade and this is one of my chart in fact it's a uh, it's right yesterday's in fact if you look at it so this is how my one of the chart which looks at basically what I do is I plot the pivots on the right side what you're seeing is the floor pivots and the globex pivots too I, I do have other pivots on a different charts but I'm actually using these pivots basically on the right side of the chart if you look at my charts my charts are about 60 only 60 percent from the left is the chart itself and then I leave the next 30 to 40 percent of it in the white space and that's where I keep all the numbers because I don't want these numbers to be you know mingled up with the charts that way you know because you, when you want it to, when you're reading the charts you need to be able to quickly see them and quickly understand that okay that's the level I'm monitoring type of thing so that's what this chart looks like now let's go and look at you know the entire topic of the floor pivots and floor pivots are you know very popular with all sorts of traders and then, and when I talk about floor pivots I'm talking about the basic floor pivots which everybody uses which is the uh, we take the average of a high low close and then I only and only use the regular trading hours okay we cannot use the globex hours in our regular trading hours because it doesn't make sense because floor pivots are designed you know which is coming from the from the actual trading hours uh, not on the globex you know globex whatever of course on the globex is a very thinly uh, traded uh, traded uh, market data anyway uh, then I only tested this on the futures and stocks uh, purely from the end of day uh, perspective I have not done uh, any analysis intraday or uh, so I have done these weekly things also and I never really found a true uh, uh, validity for using in you know, a weekly and monthly pivots, but and I'm not saying that they did not exist. I haven't found. It, okay, uh, and then then the first question we need to ask is what percent of the floor pivots uh, respect price action? So let's say suppose you know we are always thinking that okay, where is the pivot? Because that's something which I am going to memorize it literally every single day before the market opens. I wanted to know where the pivot is. So I keep that in my mind all day because, for example, today the floor pivot on ES was 1614. So every time I'm thinking about in you know, a pattern structure or anything, you know, like today when the markets fell up to 1596, and I was thinking that wow, you know, this is too far from the you know the the actual pivot. So the concept is, I'm not expecting that you know, it's going to go back up there or something, but I'm just trying to gauge the market saying, you know, whether it's, if, if there is a bounce back, you know, can it go back to the pivot type of thing. Although today it did. Today is an exceptional day with the market reverse it. In the usual normal days, it doesn't happen this way. So then I wanted to build the statistics to say, well, I wanted to take the regular data for the past year, two years, three years, and then find out if price ever came from opposite direction, came to the pivot point and then bounced at least three points from there. Because this is what the smaller traders are trying to do is can we capture this pivot bounce? You know, with, with, can we capture two points or can we capture three points? So that's what I have a thesis here and that's what my stats, uh, stats are. So this is an example here. Uh, uh, Mike, I don't know if you can see my mouse moving. Can you see the mouse moving? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Great. So here, uh, for example, what I'm, I'm, I'm showing you is this red line is the pivot. So the price is coming from opposite direction and then it bounces and then it goes up. So I'm, I'm trying to see is the level from the pivot, is it bouncing at least three points? And if it is, how many times it ever happened in the entire, in the last two, three years of data, right? So, so if you look at now this chart, this is, a, this is the ES, the similar type of chart many many days actually it didn't matter where the pivot was okay so because it's so we all really focus where the pivot is and you know we're trying to worry about the pivot you know are we trading within the pivot levels and all but many days it really doesn't matter you know where the pivot is and uh, just to show you this is a little bit of the same data without the numbers and if you see it many times it never respected it and so then I came to say okay well what is that what are the stats right the stats is that the pivot bounce happened in minimum three points only 44.3 percent of the time. It's a still a respectable number, but if this is not a number, you can use it to say, well, this is going to happen, so I'm going to place a trade every time it happens. 
right? Because the other 56% of them, it didn't happen and probably end up in a losing trade. So this is not a great number, but it's, you know, lots of, lots of us use pivots, but this is what happens, right? For only 44% of the time it actually bounced. And then, then I said, okay, well, let me reduce my threshold from three to two points. And then I'm saying it's a minimum two points. Well, it's now, it's a little better, 52%. But it's not that bad. It's not like 75% of the time it happens. So, but I don't know what is our obsession with these pivots there. You know, but I still use it. As I said, today also I used it. Uh, but the point is, this is what the number is. So don't 100% rely and say that, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to trade it right according to, just, on, just based on the pivot itself. Not that they are t totally useless, but there is a use, and I'll, I'll start talking about them in the next, next couple of slides. So the next question is, okay, well, if this is the case, does the, is the daily low and the, and the high acted as a true support and resistance? Actually, this is, a, this is a wrongly worded, I'm sorry, guys. This is the not daily, not today's low. It's the previous low and previous high. That's what we are plotting it. Is this act truly acted as a support and resistance? So I looked at that one, and then I said, yes, it did. It did a little better. The, the day, the Again, this is also wrongly worded. This is the previous low and previous high. The previous high is more reliable. I would take a number like a 61% of the time. It acted as a, like a, some resistance. That's the better number than, uh, than even the 54. 55 is still a decent number, but if it's something like 45%, then it's not a great number for me. But so that, so instead of pivots, let's focus more on to the previous day high and previous day lows. They act more as a support and resistance, a little better than the, than the pivot itself. Okay, now let's look at from the third point is on a large gap up and gap down day. You know, when I call large gap up, gap down days, I'm talking about an S&P futures, which is about at least eight points. I you know ten points would be better, but let's say eight points, right? So what happens on those days? And I wanted to see if there is a large gap down or a gap up, and then what percent of the time does the price go back and retest that pivot, right? And this should be pretty much, uh, right from the beginning, the answer should be evident. It should be far less than 42%, but it happens 42% of the time. If there is a gap down, there is no need for it to test the pivot at all. But, so, but here it does test it, so this type of thing is not a great use for any kind of analysis, but this is good for people who are trading the gaps. You know, I don't trade, you know, gaps. Uh, I, I look at the gaps, but I don't trade them, you know, because I, I only look at to see if the patterns are terminating or if the patterns are evolving from the gaps, but never to a point of thinking that I'm going to, I'm going to place a trade so that, you know, my gap, this gap is going to fill 50% or, you know, 100% or something like that. So I don't care for those numbers. Just gonna take some water here. Now the, the next point is the midpoint pivot levels. Well, <laughs> at one point of the time, this was a craze, and I did this uh, about five, six years ago myself, and I wrote this code and then saying, well, the midpoint pivot levels are, you know, the the between, let's say, between your pivot level and the S1 level, there is a halfway point. Okay, that's the midpoint. Or between your pivot level and R1 point, there's halfway point. That's called a midpoint pivot. So I wrote this and thinking that, oh, you know, these are great, you know, type of thing. Well, on a large range of days, basically, let's say, suppose if you had a previous day which has got a large range of, a, you know, 15 points or more, those seems to be a little bit inf influencer, influential and the midpoint seems to act well. But on a normal range days, it really makes no no influence at all. I mean, they just walk through the, these levels easily, and so because of that reason, and and we really don't get large range days on a regular basis. So because of that, I completely avoid it. And I, because I I came out with this thing saying that don't even look at these silly midpoint pivots because basically they clutter your chart and they do nothing else. You know, because and then it'll give you some silly ideas if it's a normal day. Uh, you know, then you think that oh, well, you know, R one, R two, or something is going to act as a resistance because of that it only confuses you. So this is how these uh, midpoint pivots look like and I would say just avoid the whole midpoint concept. 
then then if, if this is the case you know guys I, I actually have a 30 40 questions on this one but I only brought about seven or eight of them uh, to so that way we can move on to you know because I have a pretty big presentation here so the next is the order of precedence and pivots so then of course you know, you know we got all these orders right you know P low P high pivot R2 R all of them so what is the order of it and for me I think the best order comes from previous low and previous high and then pivot. These are the three important factors. If you don't give me at all on my charts, you know, the rest of all of them, R2, S1, R1, R, S1, all of them, I'm okay with it. I, I, I keep them, but I'm really okay with it. Only thing is, I do think, so that's that's my order, I mean, from the, from the highest to the lowest, okay? And how influential are these numbers, these R1, R2, and all these kind of numbers? I think in my thesis, or in my theory, what I found is, uh, in the resistances, uh, the three resistances and three supports what we have, the best resistance is R2 and the best support is also S2, right? Not the R1 or not the R3 kind of thing. So those are kind of a more reliable rather than anything. And this is, in fact, yesterday itself I was preparing for this. Uh, could you hold one minute, guys? Uh, I don't know. Okay, turn it off. Uh, just yesterday only, I found uh, a, an example because while trading it, uh, there was a, there was an example right here. So, so here, if you look at it, yesterday the prices came down to S2 level, S1608. I, I didn't take this trade, but I'm just showing you that. And then quickly it bounced it from this level. Okay, and so these R2 and S2 level, S2 levels are more reliable than any other any other levels. So that's the reason I think I kind of focus it, and then I'm trying to see if there are any patterns which are terminating or, or anything like that. And that, so those are better than uh, any other levels. And another example is, you know, there was an ABC bullish, uh, bearish pattern which is forming it. Uh, 1607.5, uh, 25 is the one which was I was targeting it. And this is the one it actually came to, the 1608 and 1607.25. If you look at the lower of that uh, S2, that's where it started. So if, when you're looking at the patterns, targets and then confluencing, that may be the better way than actually just using S2 and saying, you know, uh, uh, well, the price is coming to S2 and I'm just going to pile on and buy that thing. And I never do those type of things, but I thought that I'd let you know how it is done. So then, uh, then another thing is, you know, do first hour and the last hour have any influence on the pivots? Um, you know, I mean, general terms is the first hour is very critical for the entire day, you know, because most of the days, the first hour sets the tone for the entire day, uh, except today, you know, today was, a, as I said, it's a massively reversal day, and those days it's exceptional, but many days, first hour is the, very critical for the today's trading. The last hour is critical for the next day trading, because the last hour provides a very key element, which is the close of the day, which is, which is used it for the next day, kind of thing. So that's how the, these things are useful. But only one thing I noticed is if a price is respecting the pivot point in the first hour, then we, then we can assume that the prices, uh, the entire day, the market is far less volatile and actually trades it much more calmer. In fact, uh, I forget whether it was yesterday, I believe. Uh, it was happening something like that. The pivot was there and it was much more calmer day. Maybe not yesterday, but I forgot in the last couple of days sessions, I keep forgetting it. Uh, Mike, I, I get a message saying limit reached. Yeah, don't don't worry about that. I don't know why it does that. It's fine. There's no problem. Okay. I'm just going to go back to... <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to go back to my... Uh, this thing. Okay. Um, I think this is where I am. Yes, this is where I am. Okay. Uh, Oh, and then the last point I wanted to say is, can I build my trading entirely based on pivots? And absolutely not, because as I said, one and only one point is, pivots are imaginary lines, and these are these are support tools. You cannot really use support tools to you know completely build your entire trading strategy based on it. I know there are there are, you know lots of people wrote books about you know how to trade these pivots and all. Um, more power to them, but I have never found any evidence that you know these things truly really work. So the next one is the Globex pivots. Just gonna take some water. Uh, Globex pivots. What is the Globex pivot, right? 
Well, you know, Globex hours are usually from 4.30 uh, p.m. Uh, this is for the yes, and I'm, I'm not sure, you know, what all the other instruments do. Uh, the most of the other instruments, the, the, I don't know about the TF, but I definitely know. Uh, um, NASDAQ is the that, and YM is, I think, at 5 p.m. Uh, only I only tested the mini futures, so I really don't know a lot of other other futures. What happens in S&P futures? Uh, and uh, Globex futures are uh, Globex um, levels. They're most important in the first two hours. Pretty much right after the first two hours, um, until lunch or so. After that, you can kind of ignore them. And uh, what I found is. Uh, I'm going to show the picture of this too, what is the global experience here. Uh, but the reversals are occurring within the first two hours, and that's what usually happens is when the prices are uh, coming down to Globex low or Globex high, and usually in the first hour actually, it's quite active. Uh, you know, it can, it can uh, prolong it to the second hour. Uh, so those are the ones which I'm monitoring to see if the prices are reversing from those levels. Uh, you know, right after lunch, I just don't pay any. It's there on my charts, but I don't pay any attention right after uh, just after lunch. So the primary concept is to look for confluences uh, with other pivots or patterns or something. Again, never trade them by never trade these levels by itself. So here is how it looks like: the Globex high and Globex low, and then you know I plot them using the this center point uh, pivot and the uh, midpoint type of thing. Um, not a big evidence that this midpoint and pivots make a big difference, but definitely the high and low has a significant value in the first two hours. Okay. So just a few examples of it is, uh, you know, the Globex high, uh, this is what I was monitoring, uh, this is some time ago, uh, you know, when the Globex high reaches that point and then it, it definitely hesitates it many times, it stops it, and then it actually reverses from those levels. And the next is, uh, the, so this is the one of the pattern structure. So when, when patterns are, uh, uh, you know, forming one of the leg or, you know, bouncing off of these things, I tend to believe more that pattern and I say that because that means the pattern is forming what I call it with the uniformity because patterns must respect certain type of price levels and one of it is the Globex low and Globex high are the pivots. So here I have an ABC pattern which actually is respecting, you know, the Globex low. So that's, that's what I'm looking at in the overall concept of it because again I'm trading the pattern. I'm not trading this Globex low but I'm saying that this is actually respecting that pattern. Um, this is again, you know, the Globex high. This is one of the channel formations, and, the, and the, the, the assumption is that you know that's where it's actually ending the Globex high type of things. Again, it's a pattern structure. Uh, this is one of the other example is uh, how Globex low. Uh, this is a uh, forget my number, uh, but it's actually you know respecting these three levels and forming another pattern itself. So I, I'm monitoring to see, okay, why is it stopping at that point? You know, what is it making it stop? because of you know this particular global slow. So now if the pattern breaks out, you know, this is the descending triangle and if it really breaks down from global slow, the next attempt I will actually sell this uh, uh, sell this uh, uh, I guess this an yes uh, contract type of thing. So that's how I, I look at it. So now um, I think another example is the similar way how global slows and global highs are respected. And this just to show you some one of the chart here. Now let's look at uh, opening range pivots. And opening range pivots is that I know a lot of people get excited about it and, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's pretty good theories which is written and in fact quite a few strategies I have seen it. Seems like they work. Uh, I myself do not have a set uh, uh, opening range strategy. Uh, but again, I consider opening range uh, all these numbers, uh, all these levels as the primarily like a part of my pattern trading, part of market context. Uh, I don't trade them by, by itself, but I trade them using the confluencing with the patterns. So what exactly is opening range? So for me, I use the 60 minutes as the opening range. I know there are people who use the 5 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes type of thing, and then, you know, uh, pivots. Uh, uh, so basically what happens is the opening range is the one, as I said, first hour really sets the tone for the entire day kind of thing, most normal days, right? And then uh, for me, the, the only things which I look for is the high and low and kind of a pivot, but, you know, I'm not too, I'm not too thrilled about, the, you know, the opening range, the pivot part. So pivot is, again, calculated using opening range high, low, and the close divided by three, but I don't use pivot whole lot except the highs and lows, which is very important for me. 
in fact I do actually plot the fib so there is a one one of the small chart on my my uh, I guess my monitors it it constantly showing me you know while this opening range is forming so like for example if you take a look at uh, this is the one so here what I have is a what I call it the opening range fibs uh, basically this uh, this magenta line this is the opening range and then this is the opening range and then I plot these things it's completely dynamically plotted so dynamic departments right from uh, you know the 930 to 1030 and uh, within that it plotted and then it also plots these fib numbers everything so basically when I'm trying to analyze it I'm, I'm interested in seeing where is it actually reversing it and you know is it testing this 50 percent or is it actually testing out of this uh, this outer boundaries which is the you know the open and the or even the high effect type of thing so that's what I, I am using them part of the, you know, some type of a market context tool rather than actually using them to treat it by themselves. And this is again happened just yesterday. And if you look at this number six, uh, okay, there. Um, here if you look at it, uh, I was watching this yesterday primarily because what was happening was, you know, market fell through that uh, the open and then it was trading in a negative way. So the next time when I wanted to consider market went positive into the you know into the positive uh, you know, type of trading is when the price comes back and we and goes back into its opening rate which it never did and then basically it went there and it actually reaches the, you know, the first hour low what I call it and that's opening range and then it just quickly fell back from there. So that's what I'm looking for into some type of a context to see okay well you know is the positive momentum coming in into the, into this trade or you know is it actually trading about the first hour low or is it completely trading about the first hour high type of thing. So that's, that's part of the a structure of it and this is again when the when the prices are breaking out after the opening range happen opening range is the first hour happen and right after that then I'm trying to see okay is it actually breaking out now you know that it's going to pick up the positive momentum and move upside type of thing so that's what is one of the uh, an opening range breakout okay. and here again uh, yeah, basically it traded above that range uh, you know pretty much all day seems like so because of that reason uh, you know if I were if I'm trading this type of thing I'm never going to short it this this type of trade because it's never even given any kind of an inclination that there is going to be any kind of a negative momentum because it's trading far above its open open price and then so it's going to continue in that direction rather than it's going to so you, you need to see the prices coming back into its range and still provide you some type of a pattern to trade it but otherwise don't randomly you know go long or short on this type of trades and that's opening range and then the uh, the last of the pivots is the fib zone pivots fib zone pivots is a it's a pretty fantastic concept and i and i absolutely love it i think right after uh, I think fibs on pivots is probably my best of the pivots uh, and because I truly trust them. Uh, and then the second maybe the clawbacks and maybe uh, I guess third could be, uh, I, I would think the third could be floor, floor pivots and the last one maybe opening opening range pivots uh, if I were to rank these pivots in that thing. But fibs on pivots is one of the best. Uh, there's a not a whole lot of research done but it is that the two authors I know have done pretty good work either Robert Krauss uh, and also H.T. Jackson and they have a completely different reason why they did this research but I actually love it because I use it every single day in fact if you if you go to my website very first chart every day I post it is the, is the fibs on pivots because basically fibs on pivots is what we are doing is we are taking the yesterday's rate and in fact all these pivots are written in my book and all the formulas are there uh, you can rewrite it yourself if you want to and uh, so uh, based on what we do is we take the previous day's range that is high minus low and then we compute the pivot so we compute the pivot is you know uh, we compute the, compute the regular pivot and then what we do is we plot the yesterday's range above the pivot and 100% uh, above the pivot and 100% below the pivot and then we also plot these things like a 138% and 162% type of thing. So now we construct bands between this 138 and 162 and then say well these are the potential price ranges the price could go. So FIB zones are computed only once, once per day and they are computed right at the, uh, at the open and they are plotted on the charts. So once they are plotted in you know, nothing is happening all day uh, until the next day. So but what, what I do is I actually monitor these levels to see whether the price is you know 
uh, terminating or it's, it's actually originating any type of a pattern and how these things and they work really really phenomenally well and then so again I'm looking for a confluences and I'm also looking for I'm never taking that new trades at this point I'm always looking for my targets to confluence these levels so that's what they look like this is the fib zone pivots so if you look at it you know the FZ PPFZ is for the fib zone and PP is the price, uh, pivot point and then this is the first band which is between 50 and 62 percent and 100 percent this is above the pivot and the next band is constructed at 138 and 162. So when I am uh, trading it, I am looking to see, you know, whether where is it bouncing. If it if it really has a massive rally, what's the potential range it could go to? So that's what I'm looking at. All right. So the next one is, you know, how these are reacting uh, today. And I post these uh, all day, uh, but the very first chart I posted and then I post as these are actually occurring and reversing from those levels. So this is what, you know, most of traders do is pri primarily reading the market is to see any type of opportunities and that's exactly what I do too. So when these type of a patterns are forming, I'm trying to look for it, look for it to say, okay, well, you know, if it breaks out and that would be my targets, you know, though because I know that it's going to go to that range. So when I'm when I'm going to trade this pattern, the pattern breakout from here, that would be my first targets, you know, and then of course, you know, I have a different ways to other as to measure the patterns, but I'm just showing the path from the pivots perspective here. Uh, this is another way of you know how they how they absolutely reach to come to that point and then you know, stop and reverse it and go to the next band and then reverse it back and go to that. And this happens all day, and so that's the reason I absolutely love them. Well, that's the. I think I'm done with uh, maybe there's one more. And this is again yesterday how they were reacting to the uh, fib zone pivots. And if you look at the date, is a six five. Uh, so you know these are all from the. There's one from six four, so that's what it is. So when I so I post them and say say that you know this is what is going to happen. And yesterday, actually the low was a sixteen or six. Yesterday it did come to that point. Uh, SNS slow too. So I but uh, that is uh, I'm done with the pivot side of it. And the next one is uh, um, Mike. Um, uh, are there any questions you want me to answer, or I just uh, move move on to the next one and catch up all the questions in the end? Yeah, we're. We're good. I would say just hold the questions okay. until the end. Okay, fantastic. That's great. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> this is another one, which is the uh, you know, would you this again in a part of uh, the setting? I brought this uh, kind of a six different topics. Uh, these are all come under the same market context, and uh, so the the key here is you know whether you are a pullback trader or a breakout trader. And this is the, uh, lots of people, you know, go through this dilemma because they say, well, okay, I'm going to take a, a breakout trade. Well, when it comes to the breakout, then they suspect and say, well, you know, these three things are not well, you know, these four things are fine, but, you know, maybe I need to wait for this breakout. And then they don't take the breakout. So they're not comfortable with that. And then, well, let's just suppose if, if you say, that, well, I'm going to wait for a pullback. Well, okay, it does pull back. And when it pulls back, and then you say, well, it may pull back even further more and then because of that reason you miss too. So there are many times this big dilemma which people go on, and that's the reason I say, you know, I think you, you can trade both of them but in my book, if you are an experienced trader, it's easy to trade the breakouts, okay, because you know you're looking for multiples of things to look at the breakout. But if you're not so experienced, I think the best thing to say is, okay, I'm not trading the breakouts, I'm just going to take the pullbacks, but I'm going to commit to trade a rule or a two, a two sets of rules and then say, if those rules happen in the pullback, I'm going to take it. So then you, you won't miss the trade and then you get into the trade, I guess, if you're wrong, you're wrong, but at least you, you you have a discipline and you, you go to take the trade. So pick one side and be committed to it. And as I said, if you're, a, if you're not so experienced traders, you're better off trading pullbacks than breakouts. Because breakouts can and will fail many, many times. So let's just look at, you know, what are, what are the rules for the breakouts. Uh, in, in fact, uh, I wanted to add one more chart here, but you know, I just didn't get time. As I said, you know, I, I had a big presentation on uh, uh, on June 3rd and uh, up, right after that you know, I came back to Seattle and uh, you know it's all, all, all of it is all built in the last two days guys this entire presentation so but I was frantically building all this too but anyway um, so here I wanted to build another one which I couldn't bring it one of the 
one of the basic rules which you need to understand uh, when you're trading pullbacks or breakouts is, well, I, the way how I follow is, I'm actually trading patterns. I'm not looking at it and saying, okay, well, there's a breakout happening, uh, you know, I'm trading this. I'm, I'm trading the underlying pattern, right? So the first rule when I look out, you know, when the breakouts are happening is, you know, is the breakout happening with the two things? One is, is there a large wide bar? you know, breakout happening. Because if the bar is like a kind of, you know, semi or average kind of a size, usually what happens is those are the ones which are failing or they're kind of a falling it back in the range. I mean, that means they're falling below the breakout level. And then, then you get, you know, shuffled out. You just say, well, you know, I'm not going to be in the trade and you, get, you exit. And then two, three bars later, you know, the breakout will work anyway. So you are not in the trade because you already are. So because of that reason, what I do is I tend to look for a certain type of a breakouts, which are the breakouts which has got a, either it has a large gap or a large gap up or a gap down signaling a, a near the breakout or a wide range bar. You know, a wide range bar is, you know, something that at least at twice the normal the range, normal range. So those are the ones which I'm looking at and then I have I have automatic ways to detect the, the plot them on the screen so that way I know that when I'm monitoring I know that hey that's wide range bar and I'm going to take this trade because this is happening. And then second thing is um, as I said, you know, you must trade breakouts only from clearly defined patterns. Uh, these patterns are usually like channels, you know, let's say a rectangle channel or something or a triangle sort of basing. Basically, you're looking at the trend line breakouts. And then um, breakouts can also happen from these moving averages and, you know, key support and resistance levels and all. But in my view, I think they are actually difficult for people to trade it because trading moving averages is a, isn't is absolutely a no no for a no no to start with. And then if you're a beginner trader, it's even more risky. So because of that reason, I would just say I would avoid it. Uh, I would only look for you know a clear breakout from the tra uh, from patterns more than the more than the some silly you know moving averages type of thing. And then. Uh, um, the, if you're trading intraday, and if you're looking at intraday, then you got even more things because basically intraday breakouts must be supported by the market internals. Uh, you know, I think I I talked about my uh, CMI uh, type of indicator in uh, in my prior presentation on BMT. Uh, there, you know, I talked about how I look at the market internals, and you know, I am always looking for market internals to support everything, whatever I do. So in that case. The breakout must be supported by the break, uh, market internals, uh, or you know, if you have any other ways to detect uh, market internals, you know, there's probably thousands of breadth indicators. You know, pick like a couple of solid ones and then trade it. Uh, one of the other trick is uh, if you're trading breakout. Uh, Trade breakout bars high plus one tick. Uh, but don't trade the breakout as it's happening. You wait for the breakout to happen, and if it happened to be a wide range bar or a large gap, uh, once the bar closes, now you wait for the next time, uh, next day, next session, whatever. Uh, you wait for at least one tick. Uh, you know, it could be two ticks, or if it's a, you know uh, stocks, there is another way to compute this. Uh, you know, the high plus something else. I know you're giving a little more, but that's how you trade them. Oops, I keep forgetting that this is actually zoomed to the that part. Okay, so here is one of the example of the uh, breakout which is uh, happening in the uh, Krispy Kreme donuts. Uh, I have never eaten their donuts, but I hear that people say that this is one of the best donuts out there. Uh, but uh, uh, Chris, this is one of them which is, the, which is actually breaking out of it. The first one of the reasons this is the channel, uh, when it was breaking out, there was a clear indication that there was a massive wide range gap. A wide, uh, and also there's a gap and also a wide range bar. And these two things happen. These are the primary signals when breakouts are happening. So this is what you traded. You actually trade that bar high, which is somewhere up there, and then you actually trade this this type of a breakouts. Okay. And the next one is uh, this is one of the uh, this is the part of ABC pattern. This one I actually traded this uh, CRM. It's the Salesforce. And this one, when, when it was happening, uh, there were two reasons. One of one is an ABC pattern, and the second is an embedded ascending triangle. And in this case, the wide range bar is the clear signal for the breakout. And when it, when this one happened, I actually I started trading this, and I put the targets were 192, 206, and I bet it reached 206. But now it's uh, this stock had a uh, I believe it's a 541 or 441 stock split. Uh, it must be trading in. Uh, I don't remember if I remember correctly, it's forty six or forty seven dollars now because it's split right after that. So the next question is the pullbacks. 
as I said, pullbacks is lots of people's best choice than trading the breakouts. So the pullback is basically what we are looking at it is, um, you know, we are looking at a, a, a trend down, a trend down and then it, rever then it comes from, from there it reverts us to a key set of a support or a resistance level. In this case, this is a resistance, this is some kind of a key moving average. And then once it forms and then it actually falls down. So what does, what is the break pullbacks look like? The pullbacks are usually flats, right? Pull, because basically, you know, you're in a trend and the trend pulls back to a certain moving average and then it continues its trend. So in this case, this is the bear flag. And exact, on the right side, what we are seeing is the bull flag. Basically, the trend up and it pulls back to its a, a moving average and then it's continuing its trend, right? So yes, this is great. You know, we know that this, these type of things happen. So how do you trade them? Right. So now the next is, uh, let's set some rules around here. First of all, when you're trading pullbacks, the pullbacks must be part of a trend patterns. Okay. They can be like, you know, patterns which are trading on the side and then you're saying, okay, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you know, it, it pulls back like, you know, uh, four or five bars and I'm just going to jump on and do it because you think that it's a, it's a, uh, it's a pullback. It's not. It's actually most of the time the pullbacks must be a trend patterns and then uh, and then they're also even within the trend they're coming from a support resistance and then they're actually pulling back to a support, support and resistance. And those are the ones which have got a best higher success rate rather than you know pullbacks are happening anywhere in the, in the chart. So you need to look for a the price actually reached to a point, uh, let me go back to this one, uh, for example, uh, take the right side uh, pull flag, right? So when, when the price reached to the top of this, uh, this range of the pullback, this itself must have a, some kind of a support, uh, some kind of a resistance there, some kind of a key resistance. And then from there it's pulling back to another key support. So those are the ones which have a higher success rate rather than, you know, pullbacks which are not happening between any kind of a support and resistance. So that's what I'll be, I'll be looking for it is, it's coming from a key resistance, support and resistance to a nearest support and resistance. And there's are usually flag setups as I said already. And I tend to trust pullbacks which has got a less than 38% of its swing rate. That means, let's just suppose if you were to look at this uh, pullback, you know, the, this range should not exceed, uh, you know, 38, 40%. You know, anything 38, 40%, now you are getting into the territory of the ABC patterns, right? And so because of that reason, I want to, if, if you're trading a pullback, you're trading a shallow pullback. And shallow pullbacks are usually 38 to 40% of it, right? And also, they must consist of 8 to 10 bars. I'm not trading pullbacks which has got 2, 3 bars, uh, you know, type of thing. So, in fact, the more number of bars is better, but I definitely wanted to limit it to the 40% or less uh, range, because otherwise, you know, they are probably something else. So now let's start looking at, you know, some of these patterns, what's happening here. Right, and this is the flat setup, and which is coming down, right? And there, there is the flat setup, and this is the this is the pullback, and it's coming back from the key resistance, which is the midfoot band, which occurred here. Okay, and then let's let's look at the next pullback here. Uh, this is the pullback, which is happening. The price went outside the foot band, so this is one of the structure, and then the price came down, and it came back to the mid band, and this is actually what I call the pullback. And if I'm trading this pattern, I would love to trade this one because it's, it's, it's now I have a pretty strong evidence that it is supporting by this midfield band type of thing, okay? Um, I think that's all I have for those, uh, the pullbacks and the um, breakouts. Uh, now the next topic is, uh, uh, you know, would you trade a micro pattern or a large pattern? Uh, I guess, you know, this is a... Uh, this is something, you know, my, my again, my thesis, and uh, if you're a really, really scalp trader, you know, uh, can you really trade, you know, uh, chart patterns, you know, farming with, uh, you know, four bars or three bars kind of thing. I, and I think I, I talked about this um, in the last presentation, too, and I've seen, uh, you know, one of the books which is fantastically written, but every single example in the book is absolutely untradeable because every single example is a tiny, tiny, tiny pattern structures and uh, showing them to trade it. It seems like, you know, uh, the author outsourced, uh, you know, to a kid to go on and, hey, take a crayon and you know, draw the patterns in it type of thing. And it, it's, it's impossible those type of patterns to trade it. But the book was well written, which is great, <laughs> I guess. So would you trade these small patterns or would you trade large patterns? And that is the thesis of it here. Is a, um, 
first of all, most small patterns are very, very difficult to trade for any traders. Uh, you know, so and uh, they don't have a good reward and risk ratios. You know, if, you, if you're trading a really small channel, you know, if you put your stop on the other end of the channel, well, you know, pretty soon you know that you know that's probably literally half a point. Uh, uh, if it is a point, I would be surprised, uh, kind of a stop. And then in half a point, a point stops and they get hit real fast. So because of that, you will not generate any kind of a reward, good risk reward ratios or reward risk ratios. And then trading small, smaller patterns lead to, you know, deep start trades, uh, you know, unless you are a, you know, absolutely, you know, super duper, uh, you know, trader who can pull these, uh, you know, who can buy and sell it, you know, in a nanosecond time frames, you won't have a great success trading the small patterns. And then uh, uh, pattern sizes, but also pattern sizes must fit in each trader trading plan. You know, would you trade? Uh, would you trade a let's say you know 100 tick chart if you are a long term trader? You know, why do you need a 100 tick chart? Right? You know, you, you might better use a daily or a weekly charts. Or at the same time, if you are a you know intraday trader like me, you know, I, I trade 1220 tick charts. You know, would I trade a, a, a daily uh, chart? You know, you you can't because basically. I won't be able to look at the patterns which are forming in a daily charts, and then you know, they probably have a 20 point, 30 point uh, profit targets and you know 8 point stop losses, but that really doesn't fit into my plan. You know, my plan in trading intraday, you know, must have you know there's two types of trades which I do, and they must fit into my trading plan. And then patterns, when you trade these patterns, they must be traded with the market context. You know, regardless of, and I keep saying the same thing over and over, market context is probably the most important thing than anything out there. So that's the thing, it must be, you must be trading with the market context. So if that's the case, what, what type of patterns I traded? Well, when I look at the uh, patterns, I'm looking at, you know, three to five point target. This is the intraday, and I'm giving two, two and a half point stops. Uh, if it's anything bigger, uh, I'm not comfortable. And if I do see that an ABC or a, a Gartley or any type of pattern which I see that you know I'm going to give more than uh, you know, two two and a half points, I'm absolutely not comfortable in the trade. And in fact, uh, if I take the trade, very first target I get it, I take it and I run. And so, what's the point in, in being in those trades? Because many times you know you may get hit stops. So the and the, and the little longer terms which I also I get up I get lucky and I get these bigger patterns forming forming on the on the charts, which do have a five to twelve point targets, and then they have a uh, three and a half points as the initial stop, and then then I trail the stops and. Uh, based on the pattern itself. And these are all, you know, as I said, I completely uh, detect them. This trailing also does uh, happen to me on the charts itself. So this is the uh, kind of a micro pattern. You know, I just went and drew this yesterday and saying, okay, let's look at you know, what all the patterns are possible here. Uh, you know, this is how, uh, as I was saying, you know, that, uh, that book I was mentioning it, you know, that's how they do these, all these patterns. And, you know, probably in this, maybe there's only two patterns I can actually trade it. You know, the pattern, for example, take a look at on the right side, this uh, inverse identity of pattern. I would not be able to trade this pattern at all. Uh, I know that because this won't this won't have enough uh, range for me to trade it. Uh, this uh, this uh, this butterfly pattern probably probably, but I'm not confident. Uh, uh, this uh, this flag this, the first flag is absolutely yes. The second flag is not. This rectangle channel I will not trade it to. So these are the type of things which which are, which I look at look for it uh, to trade it. So let's look at you know the type of a. Uh, Okay, so then another one is that when you're trading patterns, you must look at you know a couple of properties. Uh, this they, this actually has eleven or twelve list, but I actually only put it five. Um, basically, you must look at the orientation and the direction. Uh, orientation is obviously you know whether it's a bullish or a uh, bearish or kind of thing, and then you know the direction is you know whether it's a, whether it's a continuous or whether you know is it a reversal pattern. And that type of, you must always keep that in the mind when you're trading the patterns is, hey, am I trading a continuous pattern or am I trading a reversal pattern? Because the rule set to trade are different. And then the size is very critical. Size, as I said, you know, you know can you trade really, really small patterns or can you trade bigger patterns? And what's your comfortable size? I mean, you need to have that in mind. And the location of the pattern. Uh, you know, location is whether would you trade, uh, you know, uh, bearish patterns forming in a bullish market. Uh, you know, you definitely don't want to think about the counter trend methods and thinking that, you know, you have an opportunity to trade it. Not that they don't occur, they do occur. Bearish patterns do occur form in the bullish patterns, bullish markets. And so you can't automatically assume and trade them because when you start trading them, uh, basically the, the 
the trend is going to continue in the bullish trend, the bearish pattern gets squashed. So because of that reason, there is no reason to even think about it. You must clearly uh, keep in mind the location of the where the patterns are forming. And the clarity is important. Clarity is uh, uh, something which is a uh, basically whether the pattern is respecting certain type of a price levels, you know, and uh, you know whether it is bouncing off of a 50 period moving average or is it bouncing off of a pivot or, or do I see that it's going to, you know, it's, it has actually its targets very, very close to, you know, so, um, um, some type of a pivot zone pivot or whatever structures you have, uh, you know, some your market context tools. So you must have that type of a clarity in it so that way, you know, the pattern can can evolve and then you know give you you know your trade and the trend quality is something a little larger. Uh, trend quality is uh, you know would you trade? Uh, let's just say you, so the way how to measure is basically you need to worry about the trend prior to the formation and while the pattern is within there uh, forming and then after that is you know when you are in the trade. That means after the pattern form. So you must look at the, within the pattern to see does the, is the, does the pattern have a quality. Uh, for example, let's say ABC pattern you are trading, you are looking at the AB leg which is let's say a bullish pattern, right, bullish uh, leg. In the AB leg you should not be seeing very large gap downs or very large uh, uh, you know bars which are like you know coming towards the wide range bars which are happening to the downside and you shouldn't be seeing you know large uh, swing uh, downs and swing ups you know price kind of a reactions which is happening in the bullish legs and that kind of tells you the quality of it and this is my continuous research and I'm still finding uh, writing these methodologies to automatically score a pattern based on this quality so that way you know that well this this pattern has this type of a this type of a score and so that way I can actually take the trade so these are some of the examples which I brought it to show you guys. These are the large patterns and these are the ones which I traded. This is the Apple's head and shoulder pattern which 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 is forming, you know, it's this pattern formed the entire of 2012. You know, that was that's what is the pattern size. Okay. And then uh, then of course, but it resulted. It resulted absolutely up to three hundred and ninety dollars was the low, and in fact, it's not done yet. I think, but you know, it's three hundred ninety dollars was the low for this, and that's what it resulted. And there's quite a bit of reward. It, uh, you know, this is the daily pattern. I mean. They need not be this you know, entire year, but they could be a couple of months. In fact, many, many patterns, when I'm trading these things, especially from the option side, you know, you have a great advantage of these things uh, instead of trading, you know, three bars or four bars kind of the patterns. And the next one is that the same apple right now is forming an inverse head and shoulder pattern, right? And this pattern is a little smaller, you know, it's actually started right in um, sometime in January uh, time frame and even until now. It's not complete, there, there is not, not, the trade is not triggered yet. The trade is, can be only triggered if it trades above 465. So, you know, I'm looking for this pattern to happen here. And this also, it will result in a pretty good, if it does trade above 465, the target is between 525 and 545 dollars. So that has a pretty good chunk to you know make it rather than trading you know two or three dollars in a pattern. Uh, this is another one which I traded. It's called a CMG, which is a Chipotle. Uh, you know this again. This also took almost a year to form it. But this one resulted. Look at from the neckline, which is broke out of a 306 to 379. Even today, I think it's trading um, just under it. I think about three. I'm thinking about 360, but I guess in that range. Uh, sorry, 370 range. And so it did reach its 100% of its target. Uh, so is this one. It's a price line. And look at it. Price line targets are in up to $800 type of thing. So, but that's how these structures are formed. And then this is the Intel. And this is another one which I traded it. This is the Gartley pattern. I'm actually trading from the bullish side of the Gartley at the bottom, from bottom onwards. And of course, now, now I'm not in a trade. But this is what it is. This is as of yesterday, uh, Intel's formation. The target is up to $28 on this, uh, in this pattern. So th when you trade these, you know, these are the larger patterns have a meaning to it, you know, and then you can trade with them with options. So the best thing is even in intraday, you have the similar type of advantages trading the larger patterns. Okay, that's the end of the uh, micro patterns. And the next one is, uh, uh, next one I'm going to talk about it is uh, uh, volatility. Uh, volatility is basically, let's go into this zoom up here. Yes, correct. 
fantastic. Okay. Um, this volatility, what I'm measuring it is, it's not the same as, you know, the options volatility, uh, you know, people talk about, and there's quite a few different varieties of volatility exist out there. In this, uh, what I'm measuring is, of course, and a lot of people use it, just the APR kind of a, uh, a number to, uh, sorry, APR kind of a, um, I guess the indicator uh, to measure the volatility. Uh, and I measure it a little different, but my volatility, the definition is how price is randomly moving between the between you know, uh, between the bars. So that's what I measure it. You know, I'm looking for you know how far it went up and how far it came down. So basically, I'm looking at something called the variance of the variance of the price over time. And this is the simple calculation itself, but it's basically it actually plots a, a single way of showing me the volatility of it. Uh, you know, you could probably build up a different type of indicators to it, but as long as you keep it very simple, because volatility calculations can also get really, really complex. Instead, I think keep it very simple and find a indicator uh, which actually shows the volatility, which is very critical because, and also one more thing is, Never guess it because people just say that oh it's too volatile and it's uh, it's uh, it's pretty safe or it's not it's not it's not moving fast enough type of thing. These are all just the guesses, you know. Never guesses. Always quantify the volatility and say that hey volatility is uh, seventy percent level. Or volatility is you know some type of a relative number so that way you know how to treat it rather than you know just guessing it saying that oh the market is too choppy. I've never understood what does it mean, you know because. It, you have to have a number associated with it. And then keep it very simple. And then uh, trade, I, I only trade a volatility when it is in favor of my trades. So let's say suppose if I'm about to take a, a, a setup like a, um, let's say, Gartley breakout or a, or a Gartley setup or an ABC setup or any of them, I'm always looking to see is the volatility in favor of me. That means is it actually too risky for me to trade it or is it actually very safe for me to trade it. Uh, Today, in fact, 11.30 onwards, I don't know if I posted there on the chart, but uh, uh, today, 10.30, 11 o'clock onwards, majority of the day was a massively swing down up, massively swing up. My volatility was saying that it's not too extreme volatility, but it was quite, uh, it's in a risky zone all day. It, it, it told me from 11 o'clock onwards. So, and what I do is I actually plot this in a, just a single, simple line, simple like a, uh, it actually like in a subgraph I plot it. And I'll show you the pictures of it. And when the when the volatility is above 50 or above, I actually call that as a risky. And I I'm very careful with my trades. I'm not trying to you know, jump into trades yet unless I have uh, lots of things going in the trade. But uh, if it's above like 65, 70, and everything, I'm completely saying I'm not going to take the trade. And then. If the volatility exceeds about 100 or more, then I know that it's extremely risky. Even if I'm in a trade with a loss, I will exit the trade uh, because I know that it's going to only get worse from here. So best basic thing is to just get out of the trade and then take the loss and you know look for the next trade or next day. So here is how it looks, and this is one of the chart uh, sometime in. December, I guess. Uh, basically, it, what we're looking at is the subgraph here. The subgraph is the one, uh, it, it plots it here, and then once the volatility, the midline is 50, and the red line on the, on the top is 100. So I'm always looking for the volatility to be below 50 level in order for me to trade it. So if it's above 50, I'm just cautious. If it's above like 60, 65, then I'm just like not even interested in taking the trades. And as I said, above 100, it's extremely extreme zone. So let me show you a couple of more pictures of it. So I'm all that I'm saying is that you, know, you need to have a, some way of uh, measuring this and then actually having a, a methodology to protect your trade. So that way you can be confident saying, saying hey, volatility above 50, I'm not going to trade all day today. For example, this is the, this happened in uh, May 1. Uh, this is an FOMC day, and here the volatility was right from uh, 11.30, I guess 12 o'clock onwards, it picked up to uh, above that range. So from here onwards, you can pretty much, you know, shut down the machine until it comes back. So now I have a, uh, even the voice alerts uh, keep on reading me and, and telling me that, you know, what's happening with the volatility. So here is another one which is all day, you know, above 50. Those are the days I'm not even looking at the trade. I know there are possibilities to trade short side here, but if it's too risky, uh, you just, I, I can't take this kind of trades. 
And then another one is a, uh, this is actually from yesterday, this is what I think I was showing you, that volatility is above 50 and risky levels. Uh, so I just, I just pretty much, you know, quit yesterday saying that, you know, from 1.30 uh, East Coast time, said, hey, look, you can't really trade. And definitely overnight it's always volatile because, uh, you know, the markets are really choppy, especially on a tick charts, it's always volatile in the, in the overnight. Um, this is one is a safe volatility, what I call it. So safe volatility is basically the where the price is when the volatility is below. It's a, so this is the green line below the 50 level. So this happens, in fact, many many days that is the case. Volatility is quite safe, uh, but there are the days which is not safe. That's the days I wanted to protect. I just don't want to trade it because you know we can't trade high volatility trades at all. All right, that ends the volatility. Uh, next is the scalping and counter trend. Um, I guess if you guys uh, have met me uh, probably, I don't know, six, eight years ago type of thing, I was a pretty big scalp trader. I was a, I used to be pretty pride myself thinking that you know, I'm a big, uh, I'm very good in scalp trading. Well, I, I guess I was good at the time, but uh, over time I realized that scalp trading is actually, it's, it's not a skill at all in my book. Scalp trading is a lot to do with the ego than to do with the skill. Okay, so basically, when people are scalp, you know, trading scalping, you know, like a one point, two points, and all, the one of the biggest thing what you need to what you are not doing is scalp trading requires a high uh, success rate in order to really make money in the market. So if you compare scalp trading to uh, you know trading you know little longer term or in taking a little bigger bets, you know if you go back and analyze it, you know you're much more calmer trading bigger bets, and then you also have a much more bigger rewards with the bigger things than than trading the scalps. So and most of the scalp traders I, I met, you know they're they're too uh, anxious and they're pulling triggers you know hundreds of times, you know. The only people who are getting rich in the scalp trading is the brokerages because they're very happy. They want to see you, you know, push this button many, many times, and that's what is happening with the scalping. So what my definition of a scalping is, uh, if if it, if you're making, you know, if your targets are anything up to two points per contract uh, in a very short term, you know, short short amount of time, you're a scalper pretty much. Okay. Oh good, I can zoom up to that too. And then uh, one of the biggest thing which you need to do is the scalp trading is you must set yourself targets and a lot of scalp traders do and I did this too and basically you should give yourself, okay this is a trade, it's a three minute trade, it's a five minute trade, uh, if it's not going to work out I'll get out. Instead of you know some people just you know take a three minute trade and you know, keep it for a day type of thing. And one of the biggest thing is you can trade scalps but you need to build a set of rules, you know not hundreds of them, just a few set of rules and then commit to I commit to it and then unfortunately you have to trade every time that presents it because as I said, the only thing, only way you can make a good money in scalp trading is if you trade uh, every opportunity presented to you and then you have to, you have to really win a lot more times uh, than you lose because when you lose, you really lose big in scalp trading. So I came up with this you know, set of rules, as I said, this is a, at least three years old and I was going to release this thing to you, uh, to everybody. This is a free book, it's only going to be like 10 pages, I think. Uh, right now it's probably four or five pages written. Uh, one of the things, what I say is, when you're trading scalps, uh, first of all, avoid counter trend scalps. Uh, I, just let me define this, I'm not going to go through all 10 of them, I'm just going to go through just a couple of them and then you know, you will have this and you can just have it, have it, have that five pages book also if you want to. Um, well, let's say, let me give you what happens with the scalp traders, right? Let's say you know, scalp traders come to the market at uh, let's say 9.30 in the morning at the, when, they're, when, they're trying, when they're trying to trade it. Well, uh, let's say there are days, you know, uh, when the market actually gapped up like 10 points or uh, 15 points, right? So guess what are the scalp traders are thinking? The scalp traders are saying, well, the market gapped up. Of course, you can't go and you know trade that gap. So the way what they think is, well, market is going to stop at some point. So I'm going to short it. I'm going to short it some silly you know price level, usually like a pivot or a you know some type of a moving average or you know some way saying, oh well, it's it's more it's more fast enough. I'm just going to do a counter trend trade here, and then I'm going to get my two points from here and then get out of it. But guess what? Uh, that will work at times, okay? That will only work probably, I would, in my way, I think it will work like three, four times, three, four times out of ten times, okay? But if you have, but, and then many times you end up in losses, and those losses 
are much more higher than the scalp what you get it for the two points or one point type of thing. In fact, I'm actually even surprised if many scalp traders even wait for the two points to happen because they're so quick. They're taking half a point, you know, uh, a quarter point, or you know, even a, you know, up to a point type of thing, and then they're happy that you know they they just won, or they just made like a point or something. But if you if you if you wait and if you actually wait for a decent pullback in this thing to happen and then you trade it, you probably get like five, six, five points and you're much more calmer than actually trading the scalp. And then, but if you, if you have to trade a counter trend trade, what I say is think very, very short term. That means you give yourself a really short time, saying three minutes, if the, if the trade doesn't work in my time, I'm just going to get out. Think very short term and then take any profits because counter trend trading is absolutely dangerous for lots of traders. And this is how the the beginner traders lose money because basically they're trading counter trend. And then uh, uh, this is the second point, is a very good point, is a, and this is someone else told me a long, long time ago and I keep in mind all this. Uh, when, when you're scalping, let's just suppose that the market is really moving fast, right? When, when the market is moving fast, you definitely don't want to give market orders because market orders, if you do give a market order, you get the worst price uh, to buy and then you get the worst price to sell if, if you're doing it. So because of that reason, in the faster markets, you always pay your price, right? That means whatever you want to pay. So that's only possible through, through uh, absolutely placing a limit order, right? And then in a slower markets, you know, the, the markets are not moving, let's say lunchtime or any other time, the markets are like in a kind of a rolling off. In that case, you pay the market price because you don't want to miss the trade. Whatever is there, you just click it and then you'll get it within a one tick of it one takes slippage. So because of that reason, I think this is something which I practice it if it's a I'm never so this will it's a help me not chase the price. I'll put a limit order and say I'm gonna wait for it and if it happens, if it happens otherwise it's okay type of thing. Uh, then let's see if I can talk about uh, yeah uh, you know do not turn a scalp trade uh, uh, let's say under ten minutes to a day trade. You know, uh, a lot of people do it. You know this is like a turning a, a day trade to you know long term investment type type of thing. <laughs> and, you know, we have all done this too in the past, so it's nothing, uh, you know, thing. But I think do not trade, especially the scalp trades, do not turn into an entire day type of thing. Um, yeah, the form of the market internals and uh, for trade the scalp trading with the market internals. Uh, the other another one is you know, uh, you set your profit and loss limits and then uh, then trade them type of thing. And so I think you know, this is just the basic rules. I'm sure you know you have seen these hundreds of rule sets uh, elsewhere too. But actually, I elaborated each of these rules in this uh, small book, uh, which is, uh, let's see if I can, oh great, okay. This is a free draft copy. If you go to my website, surinotes.com, uh, this, I said suridetail underscore scalp rules dot pdf. Um, I'll actually uh, send this to uh, Mike also, uh, if he is interested, he can actually post it on some of the forums too. Uh, if you're trading counter trend, as I said, you know, first of all, absolutely avoid your, uh, urge to you know trade this counter trend, avoid it. And then second is be quick uh, because you know take your profits and run type of thing. Uh, you know you have to be really really quick in order to win in the counter trend. And never trade random price levels. See this is where you know the pivots or silly price levels come into their play. And uh, if you're really trading counter trend, you build your rule sets based on you know some type of anomalies which goes on in the markets. These anomalies are uh, you know something like an inconsistency with the trend. That means you know uh, you have a trend indicator which is plotting, showing that you know the underlying trend is strong, but you know you're seeing you're seeing this price is actually dropping. You know, some it's creating some type of a, a divergence type of thing. In that case, you know you can say, hey, I can actually take this counter trend type of thing, and you build a rule in this anomaly type of thing. And the second is another example is if you're watching the sector strength, you know, by uh, but. Uh, you have a sector strength, the sectors are pretty strong, but there's a couple of stocks within that sector quite weak, uh, and you know they have, you have no idea why they are weak. They just weak, you know, by by just the sheer market. So in those kind of a things, you can actually take them and trade counter trend type of thing. But again, you know, trade you have to be very very cautious when you're trading counter trend. Um, that may be it, and as I said, that particular. Uh, uh, counter trend setup is not 100 percent. I, I wanted to add a little more to it, but as I said, guys, I didn't I didn't get enough time, and then I'm just going to finish up uh, my presentation with this last. Uh, <coughs> um, trader versus developer or programmer. 
you know, there's a lot of programmers out there uh, who are brilliant in what they do. Uh, you know, they can they can write uh, you know markets and they can even write these algorithms to you know slice a second to you know ten thousand pieces. They can send the orders and everything, and they you know, but they do think that you know they have these abilities to trade it. Um, you know, at the same time, there's a lots of brilliant traders out there uh, that they're very good in what they do, uh, but. 90, about 80 to 90 percent of traders are not developers, and they don't even have an inclination to it. You know, they they won't even try it. You know, they like to see the software, but they don't want to go into jumping into trading, and developing one. And on the other hand, developers who are in the market domain, you know, in the in the area of the financial markets, you know, developing tools or building websites or a, you know, or a trading tools or something, they tend to think that they can be great traders. Okay? Um, that, well, you know, they can be, but they, even within that, I would think it's only probably between uh, 10 to 15 percent of them can be very good developers and also they are traders. Uh, majority of them are not, and these are the reasons which I can talk about. Uh, first of all, let's start from the traders' perspective. Traders, you know, traders are very good domain experts. You know, they know they they monitor so much of uh, you know market or price action. They know the news and they know they have lots of you know ideas of how markets work. And the, one of the biggest thing what traders do is traders work on psychology extensively. They know when they fail, what their strengths and what their weaknesses are. Because of that, they actively pay attention to their own psychology type of thing. And they're mostly driven by, traders are mostly driven by what's next mentality because, uh, you know, they know that they probably won't make money, you know, 100 percent of the time. They know that they lose. So they build this mentality in such a way that, okay, I lost this one, that's okay, I'm going to go to the next trade. What's my next trade? Next trade. So they're always working on the what next, what next kind of a mentality. And of course, you know, their goals are based on winning and money, but they're set goals. They know that they have to make money in order to live. So because of that, their goals are very focused on money and winning. Okay? But where has come to the developers, right? Well, developers are brilliant in coding, and there's lots and lots of great coders out there, uh, you know, uh, and then their coding and um, is coding and platform experts. But developers are definitely driven by what, they, what I call the analytical skills. You know, they know that, you know, how to, how the order flow works by just looking at the numbers. And they know, you know, which indicator is going to be, you know, working this way type of thing. But their goals are never truly based on, their kind of, their goals are kind of mixed. They want to be trader, but they also want to be a, a developer type of thing, right? And then because of that reason, their goals are always kind of a mixed. And they're psychologically very poorly prepared. Uh, for the markets, and most of them are, are, you know, either engineers or mathematicians or, you know, these programmers who come from different areas, their, their psychology is completely never suited for the markets. And one of the biggest thing what they do is, uh, one of the biggest thing what, they, what traders, sorry, the developers do is, uh, you know, developers find a kind of a shelter, you know, kind of a refuge in coding rather than actually trading. You know, come 9.30 in the morning, instead of actually trading, what they do is they find the silliest bug in the code or, you know, or even think of going and say, hey, I have to change some line color or, or, you know, some thickness or, you know, or they're trying to talk to other friends who are actually in the coding world type of thing, right? And so they're trying to solve some other problems because basically they're trying to run away from the trading. And this happens at quite a bit. And it's very difficult uh, for developers to move on to, move on to the trading. So uh, because of that reason, as I said, their timing is very, very off compared to the traders. Traders are very good in timing, whereas developers are never good in timing. They know that, you know, Cisco is going to go up because it already broke out of a channel or, you know, uh, or, you know it's breaking out of 200 period moving average. They know that, one, but their timing is so off and they're psychologically very poorly uh, prepared because of that reason they never really, they really never succeed. Uh, but I think that that's one of the reasons I learned it, uh, you know, eight to ten years ago, uh, that I need to separate them. Separate them means basically I tell myself if I'm going to trade on that day, I'm going to trade 100% trading only today. I will never look at a coding. Even if somebody complains and says, send me a bug or something, I say, okay, I'll think about it later. Okay. Uh, until until I'm done, but uh, not until not until that not until I quit. Let's just suppose there are days I say, well, today is you know some FOMC day or I'm not feeling well. I'm just going to quit you know 
just doing this and I'll just go to, you know, out of my uh, eight monitor scheme to two monitors and say, I'm going to code today. I'm going to solve, you know, whatever I wanted to do today type of thing. So uh, you need to completely separate these two and then still practice it, you know, because it's a while trading, you know, you will find something wrong with your code, uh, some, you know, some bugs will come out. So you need to keep them separate and say, okay, well, I'm just going to keep them until I do, until you decide that you want to stop. That's what happens to the developers and coders. Um, there's a couple of books I thought, you know, these are these are nothing to, not not about the developers or coders, but these are the books which I thought uh, I actually like it. One of the best books which I found it is uh, called Confidence by uh, Rosabeth uh, Moss Cantor. Uh, I think uh, this book really uh, kind of gave me fantastic ideas. Uh, one of the reasons why I like this book was, you know, why do we win for like you know 10 days in a row and all in sudden there's a losing starts and this goes on for next four days in a row and then I, I never understood what what makes it you know that you know how does this streak of winning ends and how does this losing streak start and then again losing streak stops and then it you know then the winning streak start, ends so I never understood this book is pretty good and she's a I think uh, she's from Harvard uh, professor and uh, she wrote a fantastic book and I would say that you know uh, get time to read it. It's pretty light. It's not it's a kind of a thick book, but she researched a lot of athletes and a lot, lots of companies, and then uh, she wrote a pretty good book, and so I like that book too. And the next book is, uh, which is kind of uh, important, I think, uh, for uh, traders to, I, I really think, you know, uh, lots of traders are, uh, are good, but what they have is they're always looking for a some ways to you know get uh, freebies or you know some way to you know many many traders are looking for tips or many ways to you know cut corners or, or even you know their mind is not never clear and so they're always looking for you know stolen passwords or stolen books or you know or, or some way to get tips or something so and I found it that markets uh, it's very important for traders to have a clear mind because you definitely in order to really succeed you really need to have a, a clean mind and in our, so this book I found a really fantastic book uh, called uh, John Huntsman. I didn't realize it uh, after reading it. I found out that he's actually uh, dad of um, John Huntsman, uh, who I guess was the presidential candidate in the last elections. Uh, but he himself, you know, they own a pretty lot of corporation too. Uh, it's a very good book. You know, winners never cheat, and cheaters never win. Uh, so that's the that's the thing which you know. Put it in the you know, in the back of your mind and say, look, you know, you gotta have lots of clean mind. So that way, you know, it's it, it at least helps your conscious, and then you know to win it. And that's what I absolutely love this book. And uh, the last one is, of course, you know, about the uh, Ari Kiev. I think I keep saying this every time I present it. Uh, he's one of the best, brilliant books. He wrote lots of great books. Uh, a lot of uh, psychology or market psychology. Uh, I actually uh, follow lots and lots of rules from his book. Uh, a really great book. Uh, Adrian Togari, uh, she also had a, a really brilliant uh, book, The Trading on Target. Uh, she, she has a book, and I, I don't know what else she has it. I know she has got some other services, but I'm not associated with either one of them. Uh, in fact, Ari Cave is passed away too. So uh, I would recommend you know these type of books too. Uh, this, uh, these authors books are that. Um, I believe I am uh, I'm pretty much uh, done with my presentation uh, and with that and I think I'll uh, I like to go to oops I'm not sure why is this not going anywhere uh, Mike I think I'm done with my presentation okay all right guys so go ahead if you have questions okay. you can start typing up now and we'll get some of those questions answered before we go to the uh, giveaway on the books Okay. Okay, so let me take a look Fantastic. at uh, any questions that are already on the screen. Let me see here. Okay. Okay. Uh, Helder wants to know if the uh, the Fibonacci retracements that you're plotting are using Globex time frame or RTH. Um, if we can, uh, where 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 am I where am I doing this? Where is he asking? I mean, I've done Fibonacci ratios many times, but where is the which indicator? Which indicator, or if you can, where are the questions? I'm I'm trying to see it myself here. Uh, he says fibs fib zones. There's a panel on Go's oh, webinar okay. that says okay, uh, questions, and there's an icon on the right that you can undock and make it bigger. Yes, I'll do that. I'm to okay, questions. I found it, and then undock it is here. Yes, man, I do this code meeting so many times, but I'm still not good. All right, so okay, he's, he's got, saying, 
he's saying it's the fib zones. Okay, in the fib zones, it's it's absolutely there is a fib zones. We are plotting it using only regular time time hours. Okay, uh, Kelly is asking what software you use for testing out your ideas. Is it is it automated or how are you doing that? Um, it's it's all done in trade station and. Uh, Okay. You know, the very first, in fact, uh, it's a pretty good question. Very first time uh, we did this, uh, this is about uh, 2002, 2003. In fact, all these ideas came from that. Uh, it's, it's kind of a funny story. We decided at that time that we wanted to, myself and a friend of mine, we put all the data for all these uh, equities and futures into SQL Server. And then we decided we wanted to do a project on seeing, you know, like we know that yesterday's high, low, close and then a couple of other information from yesterday. And we also lay, let's say, today how the price opened, and let's say at the end of the first hour, uh, we, we know what is the high and what is the low thing. So taking all these numbers, can we predict how the market is going to close? So we call that project name called D-close at the time. And then, so we went and we did this study for about a year, playing with lots of parameters, lots of things to see, can we predict what's the close going to be? But guess what? About six months later, we found out that we can absolutely not predict what the close is going to be with the given data what we have. But that's okay, because at least we know now that we cannot predict it. But the best part was we also did many, many other pieces of analysis to see how does the price react to the Clovex high, Clovex low, and how does the prices react to the pivots and that type of thing. So all this come, came from that SQL Server data, and then, uh, you know, of course, now the testing can be done easily through the trade station. Right. Okay. Uh, Fawaz wants to know what you think of order flow and why you're not using it. Order flow is, has become a popular topic in the last couple of years, uh, basically yes. you know, um, looking at uh, uh, what's happening <laughs> inside of a bar. So I, I don't know how helpful it would really be for bigger time frames, but what, what do you think? You know, I, I, I think um, I, I studied this uh, order flow, uh, I, I would say like five, six years ago type of thing. Uh, for me, with the, the, the problem studying with the order flow or even looking at the smaller area of a, of a bar or a you know, couple of bars, is it actually, it's like a, it only shows the value if you're trading only those two, three bars. It really doesn't show in a larger way. You can probably see there's a large type of a volume coming or a large type of trades coming, you know, on a breakout type of thing. But what else will happen at the breakout? You have to have the large volumes needs to come during the breakout in order for the in order for the price to move. So that's a given thing. It's like automatically given to you. So because of that, I never found it to be useful. But this is you know pretty old, my old like you know four five year old. Theory. I've never studied out of flow, and I'm now I'm just absolutely stick to what I know is you know trading patterns within the market context. Right. Okay. Brian is asking about your volatility calculations. Are you using uh, variance around a trend line, some type of regression? Uh, yes. What do yeah. You it's a, it's it's a, it's a little complex. It's not like you know straightforward calculation, but it's not very elaborate like you know thousands of lines of code. It's not. It's about probably I would say the code itself is maybe three four I mean, a couple of hundred like two three hundred lines I think. Um, I think uh, the uh, the complexity, the variances I'm actually calculating, you know, something like the, in this line. It's not exact, but it's basically I'm looking at you know how price is moving. You know, moving how for each bar, how is it moving? How much is it moving? You know, and then what was it comparison to the previous bar, and what was it comparing to the next bar? Because that's what builds up, you know, the volatility trigger. And I don't have a volume at all because I very rarely use volume. And uh, so within this, I'm only measuring the price ranges fluctuations. What are happening? And I think I found a really neat uh, algorithm. Seems like because that seems to work really well for me. Because especially when, when plotting this, as I said, it, all that I'm interested in is whether the volatility is above 50 or below 50. And, you know, if it's, if it's above 50, you know, is it really unsafe for me to take the trade? Or is it above 100, you know, should I get out? So those are the ones which I'm measuring it. And that's, that's okay. about it. And I think, uh, I, I, in my mind, you could build these similar things with lots of other tools. And uh, so I believe, you know, you could, you could be able to. Right. How would you compare that to a different kind of volatility, like using, say, for example, the VWAP and uh, standard deviation bands on the VWAP? 
Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you were talking about a volatility compared to the standard deviation bands. No, I'm just saying your your method of volatility, you know, bar by bar, looking at how far right, prices right. moved versus mm -hmm. uh, a different kind of volatility that's quite popular is to use oh, you know, the volume okay. weighted okay. average price and then yeah. standard deviation bands. Right. Uh, I think uh, first of all, um, they uh, you know these type of the standard deviation bars and all they also kind of measure volatility, but they really don't tell. At this instant, how is it happening? Basically, you know, volatility, you know, by definition, it's basically it's kind of attracts uh, traders. Well, you know, higher the low volatility attract traders, so that way the spices move up, move out, and that's where the the squeeze in the Bollinger Bands theory comes from, right? And so, in those senses, it's kind of helpful, uh, you know, especially if you're looking for a squeeze kind of a trigger, right? But on the other hand, if the if the price is already trading let's say, you know, within the Bollinger Band, you know, uh, above the, the, the central line, at that point, you really do not have a, uh, a way to know that, you know, what's the volatility doing at this point, right? Unless, you know, the band expanded already, then you know that, hey, it's, uh, it's more, it's, or it's high, or it's contracted, and then you know that it's low uh, type of thing. But that's, that's all you know at that time. Okay. Uh, Kelly is asking if you can throw up the uh, slide with your contact information again. Uh, oh, my contact information? Yeah. Hello? My yeah, contact okay. information. Yeah. I, don't, I think that slide right there is what she's talking about, so that'll, that'll be fine. All right, uh, let's see. Melissa is asking, what is the most is, what's the most important it? rule from Arikiv that you follow? most important rule which I follow? Uh, could you repeat the question? Yeah. Mike, yeah. I was reading questions here. So. Yeah. Uh, wh which is, which rule from Ari Kiev is the most important that you follow? Ah, fantastic. <laughs> Ari Kiev, I think one of the best rule which I ever follow oh, before I ever read is, uh, I forgot which book. One of the book, what he says is, I never used to believe that uh, you could set a goal uh, I am a uh, target goal, uh, um, especially like you know how much how much you can make or how much you can lose whatever that thing. But let's say you can set a, a, a money based goal, saying and you can achieve it. And I didn't know that uh, until I read his book. He said uh, most fund managers, most hedge fund managers, they know that they have a, a rule. They have a, they're saying that okay, we're going to do this this quarter or this month or today type of thing. And I, I, I always thought that, you know, those are all, uh, you can never win those rules. And, you know, in fact, even whenever I attempted it, they never worked for me. But then once I read it, I knew that what to do with those rules. It's not just, you know, saying it to yourself. Then you need to follow it. So then I started making those rules, and I think now I kind of honed on it. You know, now I have a, a set goals and saying, okay, this is what I will do, and this is what I will achieve. And I think that's that worked for me. And I, think, I would probably think that is one of the best rules for me. Okay. Uh, Phil saying that uh, on the CMI indicator, he wants to know what was it saying today, uh, if you have that available. And also, he's asking if it's available for Thinkorswim or Ninja Trader. So you knew that question was coming. No, yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. I know. Unfortunately, it's not available for either one of them. Um, CMI was majority of the day today. Uh, I think because, I, as I said, I was actually preparing for my, this presentation today. Um, most of, so that's the reason I avoided the entire volatility. Uh, I bet it was uh, entire of that downturn, it was turned into negative. And CMI five minutes is probably picked up a little late into the volatility when the market's turned around and moving up. And I believe, I, I mean, I can probably post that. Uh, it's on my different, my trading box. I can post the image to my website, and you guys can come and see that too. Today's image, okay. I should have it. David wants to know how high-frequency trading affects your own trading. Uh, it, it probably it affects it, and I, I would not know. <laughs> if it does, I wouldn't even know. It probably does affect it. Uh, let's see. Pete wants to know how many trades on average you take on the on the S&P, on the ES. Yeah, on the ES, yes. Uh, I think I take uh, between, uh, I, you know, there are days I've taken only one trade, but the average, I would say that, you know, between three to five trades, uh, I use, I have traded about, 12, 13 trades or even more uh, at one point in my life, but I don't anymore. Okay. 
Uh, Wesley's asking if the volatility indicator is available in TradeStation. Yes, it is available. I mean, the mine is, of course, available on my website. But uh, there are other volatility type of indicators. And uh, um, I don't know if I studied all of them to say you know, they're great or they're not great. Uh, but, but I think, you know, you should be able to build one for yourself if you want. Right. To. And if you want to buy it, then all of your stuff on your website works in TradeStation, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, it only works for taxation, yes. Okay. Uh, Kelly's also asking if you uh, ever use market profile to uh, yeah. form some type of a context. Pretty good uh, question, I think. I use market context, but I use market context in the in terms of what I call the price profile. Uh, sorry, market profile, right? The question is market profile, correct? Right. Mike? Yes. Okay. I, I use market profile, but I use in terms of a price profile. Price profile means I do not have, uh, because I built it myself, and I, uh, I do not have volume part of the uh, price, uh, price profile. So I build this, and the structure comes out well, and I, I think price profile is rather accurate than uh, market profile. But I use a price profile from the perspective of using support and resistances rather than using the auction theory. You know, the auction theory is, uh, you know, many people use, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's farming, you know, where the, where the price opened up, whether it's farming in 70% of its range, you know, and how the price, you know, is going to farm them in the next 30 minutes kind of thing. I don't use any of that auction theory. I use purely from a support and resistance lines. And in fact, I project, I actually do a broadcast to uh, smaller uh, scale charts. And I also I also use the what I what they call is this uh, uh, the naked POCs and the POCs which have been not traded. So I have that type of theory, but not the auction theory itself. Okay. All right. Let's do two last questions, okay. and then uh, we'll move on to the prices. Helder's asking, uh, do you use Fibonacci okay. pivots uh, using Globex time for the 6E, or do you uh, do you have separate studies on Globex times? I don't. I mean, first of all, I use the Globex for only few things. You know, basically the the E mini futures I traded, which is a YM, NQ, and uh, uh, ES, and these are the ones which I trade only intraday, and that's the these are the only ones which I use it for the Globex pivots, and that too I'm important. I'm for me only for the first two hours type of thing. I, I don't use it okay. for any other instruments. All right, let's make this uh, the last question. Marshall's asking, how long does it take? to normally, I'm sorry, I'm having to understand this. How long does it take normally to form a large picture pattern? Are you 30% or 60% sure that there's a range? I'm, I'm not really sure I understand this question. Maybe, maybe you can do uh, a better interpretation. I'm trying to understand, I'm trying, I'm trying to understand that too. Um, how long does it take a pattern to form? Um, I don't, I don't know. See, the thing is, you definitely, I mean, if I understand this question correctly, you definitely don't want to enter into patterns prematurely. That means, you know, uh, let's say suppose if an ABC is forming, you don't want to assume thinking that, well, you know, this is, uh, this is going to turn around, or let's say suppose if, uh, if a BC leg is only like 35% and say that, oh, it's done, you know, it's an ABC and I'm going to jump into the trade. Uh, I don't know that. You know, for example, Gartley's um, Gartley's have a little bit better advantage uh, because you can trade Gartley's from both sides of it and I trade what I call the half Gartley's, you know, the first time when they're forming the, the bullish side and then I, then I trade it from the opposite side type of thing. But, but these are different ways to, you know, trade the, uh, trade the markets. But I don't think I can, uh, I have to be confident in everything whatever I trade it. I, you know, I used to pull the trigger randomly before like many many, many other traders do, but I don't do it anymore. Now I need to wait for these things to happen before right. I actually take the trades. Okay. All right. So uh, with that, uh, let's go ahead and move to the okay. uh, prizes and the, and the uh, giveaways. And if anybody has okay. any other questions that they did not get answered for yes. Surrey, then just check out his website. Yeah, yeah check out my website. Let me, I mean, I forgot, to, I guess I had to add my email. My, my email is uh, my website, which is surinotes at gmail.com. Um, that's my website, so you can just send me an email. And, uh, I'm okay. Excited. Make it time. All right, so let's take right. care of the... Uh, Thanks, guys, and I'm going to be... Yeah. Yeah. Ready, let's ready, do, let's ready do to questions. do the questions? Yeah. Okay. 
All right, guys, I'm going to be asking for your BMT username if you're one of the winners. So have that ready. If you don't have a BMT username, you can go to the website, bigmiketrading.com, and click on register. It's free. It takes about 30 seconds. And uh, I'll contact you after the uh, presentation to get the information to get the book in your hands if you're one of the two. Oh, winners. you know what? I think I'm, I, have, uh, <laughs> I have not put these things in a path, but I will be just zooming up to ask these questions, okay? All right. I think I, I didn't realize this. I just, because uh, I made the co these questions, but I didn't put them in a path, and that's the reason. Okay, the very first question. Uh, these are 10 questions, and I guess, uh, Mike, are you going to read the answers? Are you going to send me the answers? What's the deal? Uh, you, you go ahead, and I'll, I'll try to, uh, you try, I need you to try to look at the questions that come in for the right answers, okay? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, what's the, what type of bars are you, are, or for breakout trades, what type of bars do you use it? Okay, I think I got the answer. Okay, what's the answer? What's the answer? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, one gentleman who said, uh, trying to, I'm trying to look for the first person said it. Okay, there's so many said it quickly. Okay, I think Kevin Long. Kevin Long is the name, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, Kevin Long. And what, and what was the right answer? It's it either wide range bars or gaps, either one of them. Okay. And Kevin, I need your BMT username, please. Okay. I had to do this manually, unfortunately. I forgot to put them in the path. <laughs> okay. What is the basic theory behind pullback trades? Okay, just let me know when you see the answer. I have not. <laughs> oh, hold on. Yes, I think this is the guy. Uh, Michael, um, I'm trying to see his name, Michael. That was? Sistinch. Oh, okay. We got, we got multiple Michaels, sorry. Michael, Michael Sistinch. Gotcha. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Michael, <laughs> if I murdered your name. Uh, that's the name. I think the answer is, you have to look for a pullback which is coming from a key support and resistance to a key support and resistance. Okay, okay. and so uh, yeah. Michael S., I need your BMT username, please. Okay. okay, the next question is, what are the most reliable resistance level in floor pivots? What is the most reliable resistance? Okay, I think we got the answer already. Okay, so guys, stop. Uh, I think, uh, yes, yeah, Sam S. Okay. Sam, Sam has, it is R2. It's a, I'm looking for resistance and it's a support also. He said both, uh, but I think uh, support R2 is the right answer. Right. Okay, so Sam S, I need your BMT username, please. Okay. Okay, I want you guys to fill this. Uh, volatility is, the, is variance of two um, it is like two dashes. What are those two? I think it's supposed to have an and in between, but two words I'm looking for. Okay. Oh, good. This guy, uh, Oleg Mitrofanov. Tough enough? Okay. Well, okay. again, I need your BMT username, please. And, sir, and, and what? Yes. I'm sorry, go ahead. What was and the answer? answer is that volatility is a variance of price over time. And time, I guess. Okay. That's, he has got a good answer. Okay. okay. The next question is this. Which of the following breakout should not be traded? Okay. Should not be traded. Okay. First is a trend line breakout. C is a, a B is a channel breakout, a C is a moving average breakout, D is the ABC bullish pattern breakout. Okay, there's a tons of uh, answers already. 
I think we'll just take this guy. Um, I think we got the answer. It's uh, it's very simple. Uh, you should not create the moving average breakouts. Uh, so C is the right answer from Kai Reed. Kai Reed. Okay. Kai, I need your BMT username. Okay. This is the one. Uh, the sixth question is: What is the minimum number of bars of retracement in a pullback setup? At least the ones I follow, ones I talked about. There's a guy. Yes, <coughs> we got the answer. Uh, Brian Bush, B U R C S. Brian Bush. Okay, I'm trying to locate. Okay, here it is. Okay, Brian, I need your BMT username, and what was the answer, sir? Uh, it's eight minimum. It's 8 to 10, I call it, you know, the higher is better, but you don't want to have like 400 of them. Okay. Okay, the next question is, when trading intraday breakout patterns, what do you look for support, uh, what do you look to support uh, these breakouts? Ah, there is answer. Fantastic. Um, uh, his name is Joe Roma. Joe Roma. Okay. Uh, Joe, Joe, Joe Roma said uh, internals. You, when you're looking for a breakout patterns, you must look at the market internals, and they need to support your breakout theory. Okay. So Joe, I need your BMT huge name. Okay. okay the next question is coming. Okay, if you're trading S&P mini futures, what time does Globex session ends? Uh, I think uh, you know what this is. I, I got to say that the Globex session ends uh, the East Coast time. Let's say. Right. All right. I think we got the answer, but uh, I, I'm not sure if it's. Uh, um, basically, there is a it's a 9:30 East Coast time, which is a Wesley Seminato Simon Seminato. Right. Wesley right. okay. Seminato. It's so 9:30 a.m. Yeah, need I was going to say a.m. p.m. Yes. Right. Okay, Wesley, I need your BMT username. Discussion. How do you trade midpoint pivots on a normal range trading day? <laughs> I like this guy. Yes, fantastic. I think you got the right answer though. Uh, Josephine Fala, Fala, F F L A A L L A H. You don't. <laughs> That's right. Yes, absolutely right. You don't. <laughs> Okay, uh, Josephine, I need your BMT username, please. And Wesley, I'm still waiting for your BMT username. Okay, the last question. If you are trading S&P E-mini futures intraday, let's say, what's the minimum target and stops for a small size pattern you should consider? So I'm looking for both target and stops. So just give me range or give some two numbers or whatever, but uh, I need two numbers. Oh, good. We got already one answer. Cool. Um, Scott Tamba, okay. T O M B A U T H. Right. Uh, the minimum you need should, I consider these three points, three to five is the best, but three to five uh, and two point stop. Okay, Scott, I need your BMT username, please. All right, guys, so congratulations on winning uh, one of these 10 books, and I will get in touch with you uh, here shortly uh, after the webinar is over to get those books in your hands. Also, I want to remind everybody that the entire month of June, we've got 16 webinars. Uh, this is the third one, so we still have a lot 
more to come, a lot more prizes to come in all those webinars. I'll post the recording of this on BMT sometime tomorrow. And uh, uh, if you guys have further questions for Suri, check him out on his website at surinotes.com. Thanks very much, Suri, and I'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for inviting me. And thanks, uh, thanks to all, all of you guys. And um, I guess if you have any questions, just send it to me, uh, to my email. It's surinotes at gmail.com. Thanks again, Mike, and congratulations again. Sure. Thanks, sir. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye.